coming up on Miked Up. You gotta have that support system. I know who to go to on certain things because that's their specialty. So I think having a strong support system, no matter what kind of business you run, and even like I was mentioning that accountability group, you know what? We're in different industries. We have no accountability. I mean, we have no relationship business-wise or financially to each other. We're doing it to help each other, holding each other accountable. And that's, a, to me, a huge support system. It's like jumping in the foggy abyss. You don't know what's down there. You just know you have to make the jump. You just hope for two things, that you can find some, a parachute or you can find someone to help you then ride tandem. Otherwise, you're going to go splat. You just don't know when. Welcome to Mike Up. I'm your host, Mike DeChocho, and on my show, I interview entrepreneurs, award-winning authors, entertainers, business leaders, athletes, and other talented individuals who I personally invited to join the show to inspire you to be brave and bold in pursuit of your dreams. If you dig this show and are looking for more inspiring content from incredible people, click the subscribe button and you'll be notified of each episode release. Subscribing is free and it means the world to me that you've chosen my channel to tune into. You can give a gift of thanks and appreciation for providing this content to you. Simply visit patreon.com backslash miked up, M-I-K-E-D-U-P. Any amount is greatly appreciated and totally unexpected. I welcome you to connect with me on my other social channels as well. All links are clickable in the description to make it even easier to connect. Thank you again for tuning in to Miked Up. Enjoy the show. Our guest today has an impressive track record to skyrocket predictable profits through clarity of message, mission, and management. He has built and implemented game-changing strategies that gain a competitive edge for long-term success. He's created and owned seven six-figure businesses, operated three other businesses generating between 20 and 35 million in gross revenue. He's operated divisions of three brand name Fortune 500 companies. In less than an hour of meeting with your business, he can uncover 50 to 100,000 in hidden revenue without spending more on your marketing or advertising budgets. Hey, that's music to my ears. Welcome to the show, business coach, or should I say biz coach, Steve Feld. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm excited because you come with this incredible story of how at different points of your career, you kept going up to the next level, right? Something we talked about off camera before press and record is fulfillment. And you just continue to rise. And that's why I wanted you on the show. You inspired me when I met you a couple of weeks ago, and I'm excited to unpack your story. Thanks. It's all about moving forward. I mean, business owners, it's a lonely world out there. It is. We can all learn from each other. You know, well, it's funny. You said moving forward and I said unpack and you just moved and you're unpacking boxes and kind of in a new chapter of your life, which is exciting. It is. And that's the thing. It's like business owners get to a certain level. Are they happy there? Some are, some aren't. Or are you going to take it to really fulfill your passion and your dreams and move the dial? That's where I think always the magic happens. Then you get to that next plateau and it's like, ready to do it again? Let's keep on going. Well, that's the thing. You're driven by purpose. It's not necessarily like, hey, we need to make X, Y, and Z in business. Of course, it's financially driven. When you build teams, you get responsibilities and you want to see it financially successful. It's silly. Why would you not? But the difference in it being a business that's basically breathing like a human that's existing, opposed to something that's purpose-led and driven. That's not just an Instagram post, right? We're talking about real <laughs> things that we're passionate about, and that's what drives us. So can you share a little bit about, I want to go back, 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 and early on into your story, when did you start to feel that heart tug that you knew you wanted to serve in ways that would lead you into this business? Was there someone that inspired you at a young age? And how did you get into like that first opportunity in business? Yeah, well, my parents are entrepreneurs. They each owned a business. So I had the two working parents. But I think my entrepreneurial journey kind of like mirrored them is I'm started selling sodas, chips, and candy out of my locker in elementary school. Well, it progressed in junior high and then high school, it turned into term papers and college, it definitely turned into term papers. And it was like, I always had that entrepreneurial spirit because it's like, the way I looked at it, it's like, I'm passionate about helping others 
grow to their potential and achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. And then when I started in my own businesses, my first business was writing business and marketing plans for techies. I'm not a techie. I don't speak tech. Well, I was also niched into the tech industry. Well, for those of you who've been around a while, you heard it. Tech industry had a bubble burst and yep, my business burst right along with it. But I could do one of two things. And that's where I thought my passion really lies. It's like I can curl up in a ball and cry like a baby, which a lot of entrepreneurs do, and then give up and go get a J-O-B. Or come on, let's think this through. Go get some support. Go get some help. Bounce some ideas off and get back on that horse. And that's what I did. Less than a week later, after my whole business crumbled, <laughs> watching the tech yeah. bubble burst, I lost everything. All my clients, all the stock options, boof. And it was hard. When was this? 99, 2000? Yeah. The whole tech bubble just popped. And yeah, 08, 09, the economic downturn. Yeah, 08 was more of the real estate deal. But what was it, 99, 2000? Yeah, the big burst then. Yeah, I have to say, like, I totally agree with you about entrepreneurs. But I will say that to speak of ones that don't give up, it's a resilient group of people. I mean, you don't start a business unless you know, like, you do it for that crazy, typically heart tug. You don't walk away from a job or financial stability to just start something so you can beat yourself up. That sounds a little ridiculous. But I'll say it's the craftiest group of people I've ever been a part of. And exactly like you mean, you're resourceful. I want to talk about me. I'm interviewing you, but just to share my quick story is, in the last four years since I started Social Chameleon, my company, aside from financials and aside from the cool products and services and the people I've met and the networking and all the cool things I can say I've done, the thing that is really cool that came with it that I didn't necessarily realize I was signing up for is that resourcefulness. Like if somebody makes plans with me and part of the plans falls apart, I don't even ask others to figure it. I just like, okay, so if the map isn't working, we're going to go here, we're going to do this, and this can happen here. And it's just a matter of like, if you and I say we're going to come up with a new product or service and something goes wrong, we don't say we're just not going to do it because the first door we walked into is locked. No, we're going to go look for other doors. It's just because you run into one part of the maze that doesn't work, we continue to freaking go. And I, that's what I love about entrepreneurs. You mentioned your mom and your dad. What a way to learn watching them, right? Yeah. Talk a little bit about your parents for a moment. Did you see varying levels of success with them, I'm sure? And talk about that. Yeah, you see the highs and the lows. I mean, it's not some smooth, beautiful, unicorn, rainbow fantasy with sparkles. It's a tough road. And especially, you know, well, one owned a bar and one owned a liquor store. Go figure. <laughs> and they were in different parts of town, so they weren't even close to each other. But it's like, I, so I grew up around that environment, working in that environment. And I started realizing to make something successful, you got to put the time in, you got to put the grind in. But things I've learned was you have to have a plan. And yeah, you're going to have some hiccups along the road, executing the plan, just like you just mentioned. It's how you react to those. It's like, woe is me, or do you find a solution? And my parents seem to always find a solution. It's not about if it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Yeah. You just don't know what. <laughs> It's when, and then it's how you react to it. And the thing you said is something that my dad has, you know, my father passed away last year, but he had a high school diploma, but he was one of the smartest guys I knew as far as just like a history buff, and he knew his sports history, and he was very sharp. He knew all the family members' birthdays, cousins, aunts, uncles. He was a guy that kind of had a really sharp mind. And the one thing, he never went to school for business or anything, but he always would tell me in life, you got to have a plan. And I know that sounds super simple, and it is kind of simple, but it's also true. No matter what I did in life, you have to have some kind of idea of what you're solving for. And when I look at the mistakes I've made in business or personal life, it's usually knee-jerk reaction stuff that hurts me. It's not the, oh, I've actually thought this through and planned it out, because those things that are more calculated tend to have more accuracy of success. And so it's, it comes back to dad saying, you got to have a plan. That's it. I couldn't agree more. 
Something that I think is interesting, talking about your early business mind came from your parents. You had your mom, your dad, both running two separate businesses. I think this is interesting, too. You were director of global merchandise for the Harlem Globetrotters, which I have a love and affirmation for. My dad actually took me to see them as a kid, and I love the Globetrotters. You also were a GM for Rawhide. I know you live in Arizona area. So that's the one in Phoenix. I don't know if there's multiple or not. I've been there. I enjoyed that as a kid, too. So both the Globetrotters and Rawhide, I have uh, personal great memories growing up. Those are kind of two unique, really cool opportunities. How the heck did you get into global merchandising for the Globetrotters, and then all of a sudden you're a GM for Rawhide? Yeah, for the Globetrotters, I got a call one day out of the blue, and someone says, hey, we got an opportunity for you to work at the Globetrotters. And I thought it was someone from my past messing with me because I used to travel with musical acts with Warner Brothers for years and years. And so I thought someone was messing with me, so I hung up. Every time they called, I kept hanging up. Third time, they kind of like laid it all out, like, hey, you hang up this effing phone again. <laughs> you know, you're going to miss an opportunity. And I thought, okay, what the heck? And Globetrotters were headquartered in Phoenix. So it was a legit job. I actually turned their whole merchandising world around. Did you have a background in merchandising at that point? Yep, and global and licensing and global distribution. Yep. Where did you learn that, Steve? I mean, that's a huge role. Like you were in charge of all the global merchandising for the Globetrotters. So where did you learn how to do all that? Did you go to school for that? No, I started touring with musical acts. My very, very first tour, I was, I think, the number eight guy on the tour. And I was just barely 16. It was the Scorpions tour. And I'm thinking, I'll never go on a tour ever again in my life. This is chaos. You don't sleep. You, oh, food's horrible. You're just work, 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 work. And you're a different city. And then years later, I, I, I put myself through college by working weekend shows, touring with multiple companies. And then when I graduated college, I had an opportunity to help start up a company in the merchandising world. And we blew it up. I was employee number five. When I left, I, they had over 500 employees. So I've been around the world a few times, learning merchandise operations, logistics, distribution, production, just in time, forward head. I've created projection programs. So I really nailed it down. I was doing some of the biggest tours in the world. And it was like, okay, I got tired of the road and I left. And then a couple of years later, I, well, bounced around and uh, ended up at the Globe Trotters, turned their whole merchandising operation around to like very, very profitable. And then after that, I got a call to be the operations person at Rawhide, which is an 1880s Western theme town. And I'm like, why are you picking me? And they're like, you're a turnaround specialist because I've owned and operated other companies doing it. And I came in and we turned the whole company around and so well, it got sold and I had to move it to a different city and rebuild the whole 1880s Western theme town and became the general manager of that. We built it all up. And I got to experience it, man. I got to see it firsthand. It's fun. I loved it. The cowboys getting you know, fake shooting through the yeah. windows, falling down on yeah. top story of the building. Stunt shows, gunfights. Yeah. And I'll tell you, like, I just love your story because it's unique. It's not the same thing. And what I'm hearing from you is that you learn by doing and then in the different opportunities that you, you found yourself in, you're on tour city to city with, with Scorpion. That could have just been like, okay, cool. I'm either going to do this forever with different bands or maybe this wears itself out and I got to go and get a real job, right? Or something that's in a different entertainment industry. But you were willing to be like, well, Rawhide, this is different, but I'll figure it out. I'll make it work. And then you like became a turnaround specialist, as you kind of termed it. I think that's cool. I'd love to pick your brain on that for a moment. When you go in and you look at a business, what are the first three things you evaluate to know kind of the status of where it's at and how you're going to fix it in your head? What are you looking for? First thing is I look at their financials. Yeah. Because numbers don't lie. Unless it's garbage in, that'll be garbage out. So financials will be the first thing. I was hired as a consultant, if you will, but I was their COO. And my very first board meeting, because I was part of the board, I'm not even hired on technically for another three weeks. And the CFO is giving their report and I'm like, okay, 
I know numbers. I know how to read financials. I don't have a clue what this guy's talking about. I said it out loud and I'm thinking, great, I'm going to be fired by the board before I even start. (laughs) And they go, wow, that's a big revolution. I'm like, what do you mean? They go, we can't figure out what he's been saying for eight years. I'm like, oh boy, we got bigger problems here. Hold the phone. (laughs) Everybody's been doing the old head nod in the board meeting, but nobody's going, Johnson, how are we getting to these numbers? Yeah. And I was the first person to like voice it. And I'm thinking, okay, this is the quickest gig I've ever gotten, right? I'll be in and out before my year's up. And they made me the CFO too. What a lesson right there, guys. Vulnerability is okay. Steve's looking at it like, man, I don't totally understand the analytics here. But it was because the analytics kind of had holes in it. And if he would have just played the look smarter than you actually are, then he wouldn't have helped them and he wouldn't have been helping himself. But they liked the fact that you were like, something doesn't look right here. I'm not getting a full grasp of it. And they looked at you and they didn't say like, well, you know, you're not qualified like we thought you were. They said, man, what's going on? Something doesn't seem right. They just asked me that one question. It's like when I said this doesn't jive, I mean, we're getting a four inch packet for financials. Guys, this is a board meeting. We should be getting four pages. Uh And they all go, I agree and all this. And I'm like, any of you understand what's in this? And they're like, no. And I'm like, that's a problem right there is one of the biggest problems you have in your business. You don't know your numbers. Mm -hmm. They got rid of him, made me the CFO. And then I started full audits across the board, internal audits, and then also HR audits, because that's usually where companies bleeding and they don't even know it because it's, Hey, it's HR. It's okay. And then also their marketing and advertising is like, how are we getting the word out? Is it a consistent message? Is this consistent with your brand? Does it make clarity to your prospects and your clients? And that wasn't working. They had disjointed messages and it's like, oh boy, it was a lot of work. It all connects. I think people are like, all right, we got our sales team and we got our branding team and then they don't even talk to each other. And then marketing and branding are... One direction is trying to do, if we do X, we want Y in return. That's more of the marketing. Like we put 100 mailers out. We expect three people to call our phone number. Kind of marketing or billboard. 10,000 people drive past this. We need 10 people to buy our services for it to pay for itself or whatever, 100 people. And they know their numbers. But then the branding is just more like, what do people feel and think about when they experience their products, services, the people of this company? And that's like more of when you think of Apple computers, I like using Apple computers. So right away when I think of it, it makes me think of the things I get done and create with Apple products. Some people don't, but it's just, you know, you think of Disney, you think of the moments with your family when you go there, what it feels like, and you just have to say the word and it all comes with it. And that's the brand. But the marketing is the, you know, Once you go to their website and you get 17 emails every month saying, why don't you come back for your next visit? It's the 50th anniversary. Well, that's the marketing. But the branding is all the other stuff. So you get it. I'm like, I'm not trying to educate you, of course, but I'm just saying it out loud to our audience because a lot of times people lump it in and you're saying, look, we need all of these things pointed in the same direction, which is going up. So get your financials right. That's tough, though. I'm thinking of myself as a young entrepreneur. I know a lot better today because I actually hired someone, which is what we were going to talk about. Ding, ding, ding. You're the smartest guy right there. (laughs) (laughs) I hired someone who's smarter than me to look at it. But guess what? Michael Jordan had a coach. I know you say this all the time. 12 coaches. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a fitness coach, a dribbling coach, a passing coach, a shooting coach, a free throw coach. I mean, he had all these co- head coach, right? Offensive coach, defensive coach. <laughs> the best of the best of the best have someone they're working with to get better. So why would you not do that for your business, right? And I know a lot of people say, well, I don't have the means to get there. Well, you're also not going to have the means to get anywhere without it. So if you can cut from somewhere and pay someone like Steve or anybody that's, you know, more qualified than the person in that scenario, it's going to be helpful. I hired a bookkeeper this year and I hired a a financial, they're not necessarily my advisor, but she looks at my business and she says, okay, like we're talking about profit. I'm reading profit first right now and we're taking the systems and she's kind of like holding me accountable to do these things. I mean, she's even, you know, got me looking through bank statements and understanding where things are being distributed to that I kind of took a bad approach out of sight, out of mind. I don't want to think about if I had a bad day financially, 
I don't even want to think about it because that's like a quarterback who throws an interception. They don't have the coach tell you you throw an interception. They're trying to drop the next best play. And that's how I handled it. But that's also not good because if you're never figuring out why you threw the interception in the first place, you keep throwing them. But you got to look at the game film. And the game film is your advisor inside your business going, hey, you're doing some things that are causing these problems to happen. It's not chance that it's happening. You got to fix your... X, Y, Z, your stance, right? And that's what a coach does. So I think that's awesome that you bring that up because, you know, not only are we promoting you and your services, but you're just saying that in general. In general, people can tighten up what the heck they're doing by having a mirror, which is an active live person, not just a book. Books are great, but the book's not going to talk back at you. They don't hold you accountable. I mean, I read a lot of books too. I mean, a lot of books, but you know what? I read one book, a 12-week year, and I suggested it to about four other business owners who I thought who would enjoy it as well. Well, we all read it together on our own, and then we got back together, and we said, let's create an accountability group based on the 12-week year. So we did that. All of our businesses went like this together, and we only meet for 30 minutes every week, 30 minutes, and it's that much of a jump because we're holding each other accountable. People spend 30 minutes being sidetracked when they peek at their phone. I do it every day. I go, what the hell? I just lost an hour of my time. And I'll go on my phone because I'll get a notification about something. An email came over. And then because I'm on my phone, I just go, oh, let me slide into Instagram real quick and see if anybody's liking that last post I posted. And then I click on it. And then I'm all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, my buddy just posted he had this event. And I'm watching the video of the event. And then 12 minutes later, I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. All I was supposed to do is see that Steve emailed me to say we're on for tomorrow. And I just lost 15 minutes of goofing around. And people do that. And it's a half hour. Now you're talking about there's your half hour to meet and better your business. And people say, I don't have time. Dude, everybody's got 168 on the calendar in a week, 168 hours. It's what you do with it. The best business people create time. If it's important to you, you're going to do it. Do we all create time for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? My biggest problem, I had to actually start scheduling breakfast, lunch, and dinner because I was giving so much. And I said, you know what? I need time for me. And then I put in you know, time for meditation, my journaling. And guess what? Everything got better. I had the time. I was just using it ineffectively. And once I started using it effectively towards my personal and business goals, it's like, wow, I love life a lot better. (laughs) What are some of the systems that you put in place? Are you the kind of guy that marks down every 15 minutes what you're doing to optimize your day? I did that and made me very depressed because it took me out of my zone. (laughs) So I do time blocking. I live and die by my calendar but I'll block out strategic time every single week. This is time, no distractions, everything's else off. It's pen on paper. It's really, what am I going to do this next week? Is it achieving to my year goal, my monthly goal? Mm -hmm. And it really gives me the time to focus. So I have my to-do lists every night before I go to bed, look at them. So it's ingrained. Then the next day I open it up. There's my to-do list. It's ingrained. It's ready to go attack. It's not like wake up, do your normal stuff. And then what am I going to do today? That's a killer. That should never come out of anybody's mouth. I don't care if you're not even busy or an entrepreneur. Like sometimes that feels good. That's my vacation mode. I say no to the itinerary. There's two different vacations. There's the family vacation where you have an intentional itinerary because there's a lot you need and want to see and you're trying to please multiple people. Those vacations could be stressful for parents, right? But they're also very fun. My kind of vacation is the, what the hell am I going to do today? But that's turning it off because every other day I go to bed and the whole next day is articulated on a calendar. The frustrating thing for me is when I put too many things in there, which forces me to not get it done. So then I'm either up till literally three, four o'clock at night and then like pushing it into the next day. But, you know, there's deadlines in business. There's a client says, I'll hire you to do this. And then Steve says, I can do that for you. And well, guess what? He's got to deliver it. And Steve's not sleeping until the damn thing is done. And hey, no complaint on it. We said we would do it. You get the job done. But I will say that once you better your systems and processes, you're more likely to get that thing done during a reasonable hour. And that's my biggest thing. So I want to take a quick time out because we want to hit our sponsor, which is Social Chameleon. We'll talk a little bit about that. We will be back in 60 seconds with Steve. Guys, don't go anywhere.
Podcasting is a great way to engage with your audience and stay consistently relevant. The only problem is you don't have the time or desire to produce your own show. You simply want it done for you. And that's where Social Chameleon comes in. All you need to do is press record and upload the files. We'll handle the rest. From planning, production, post-production, distribution, and digital marketing, we have you covered. We realize that times are tough and funds are tight. And Social Chameleon believes in building supportive business relationships. By clicking on the link in this promo, we'll provide you seven free podcasting tips to get started, as well as a free 30-minute online consultation. This is the perfect opportunity for entrepreneurs, keynote speakers, industry experts, influencers, and anybody who has a personal brand. With Social Chameleon, we help you build a brand that is out of this world. We're ready and waiting. So what are you waiting for? Click on the link to get started today. All right, guys, we're back in action with Steve. Again, you can check out his website. I'll give that to you real quick. It is bizcoachsteve.com. All of his social media is clickable in the show notes. He's in the process of moving right now. So if you don't see him as active on LinkedIn, it's because he's tuning into a whole new chapter in his life, which is exciting. But I know you are very active. I'm kind of teasing you a little bit on LinkedIn. Great network that you've built. Let's talk about that. I mean, behind every great business owner, successful entrepreneur, great person, whether it's an athlete, a movie director, someone that we see on the cover of a magazine, they're not doing it alone. Can you talk about the community that goes with success in business? Absolutely. I mean, you got to have support systems in place. You were talking about you know bringing on a coach. It's like I had one business. I was miserable in it. I felt like I own a job. And that's not a happy place to be in. It doesn't help your family life either. And it just drains you and brings in a lot of negativity. I said, I can't live like this anymore. So I went and looked for a coach. The second I got a coach, within 45 days, all of a sudden, everything changed. My outlook, everything started changing. As I progressed through multiple businesses, I also realized I need a support system. I can't do everything myself. Just like you mentioned, bringing on a good CPA, a good bookkeeper. If this isn't what you love and you're not passionate about it, do not do it. It's going to cost you God knows how many hours. That's the problem, Steve. I wasn't doing it, so it wasn't getting done. <laughs> Because I hate it. I don't like Excel spreadsheets. It's not fun for me. I, they, they, they make me quiver. And you're like 90% of small business owners. They don't understand numbers. So let's keep it away from me. But hire those people. Get them on your team. It's like, okay, when I'm working with a client, I'm well-versed in HR. But do I want to go into a business and set up their employee policies and do all this stuff? Heck no. But guess what? I have a support system around me. I know I have vetted these people. They are unbelievable. They are passionate about HR. Guess what? I bring them in. Does that make me and my client a lot better? Yes. So you got to have that support system. I know who to go to on certain things because that's their specialty. So I think having a strong support system, no matter what kind of business you run. And even like I was mentioning that accountability group, you know what? We're in different industries. We have no relationship business-wise or financially to each other. We're doing it to help each other, holding each other accountable. That's the mastermind group, Think and Grow Rich. You know, that's one of the things I learned from that book is the importance of a mastermind. I recently started my own mastermind. It's one of my favorite parts of my month. It's always the first Wednesday of every month. It feels nice and fresh to get in there knowing that people are going to be like, okay, let's get the best version of Mike. And then I'm saying, let's get the best version of everybody on the team. And all of us are either solopreneurs or small team entrepreneurs. My team is myself and three others, but really from like a leadership standpoint, decision-making is all myself right now, which is exciting, but also it's tough. And so having a mastermind that solopreneurs can go and say, hey, it's like a board of directors meeting. Is this even a good thing for me to do? I'm trying it. It's not working. And then someone else can say, I did that same thing, similar experience, different experience. And now all of a sudden you're bouncing ideas off with a team and you don't always get that as a solo entrepreneur. So I'm encouraging the audience, if you feel kind of stuck, maybe the people around you aren't resonating at the same level. Hey, cool. As long as you understand it, family's great. And I love my family. I'm Italian. We're all about family. 
But at the same time, they don't understand that a lot of the crazy, if not all of the crazy parts that go into the business that I run. And I don't know if they'll ever get it. And that's fine. But I need to get myself around people who do get it and understand it and appreciate the things I'm doing and then can even coach me up, like you said, or bring the best out of me. And so thank you for sharing that. Anything else you'd like to say for that kind of the solopreneur who might feel stuck right now? Maybe they're limited in resources, but they're also around bickering. Hey, when are you going to get a real job? You tried this for two years and you're not successful yet. Go back to selling insurance or whatever it might be. So what would you tell that person right now? Yeah, I agree on getting in a group because I've facilitated many mastermind groups and building up a new one right now. The magic that happens in there, think of them as your non-financially committed advisors. Where else can you get that? Yeah, you do have to pay usually to get in a good mastermind group, but I swear to God, your ROI is going to be, it better be tremendous. Get with people or like-minded people. If you're around the negative Nellies, that's dragging you down. It's dragging everything you do. You might not realize it. It's dragging you down. So get around people that can be supportive. Even your local chamber, you know, they're all there trying to better their business. You might have the negative Nelly. Get away from them. Next. But get a support team to really help you out. Because being a solopreneur, that's it. You're solo. And by getting the feedback, you think you can do it all yourself. I'm telling you right now, I've seen it. I've been it, done it, lived it. You can't. You do need help and find the right people. Even when you're doing the right things, Steve, you don't know if you're doing the right things. You don't know it. How do you know? Like, what do you compare it to? Nobody's there to say, this is good. Like, if you're a quarterback and it's the first time ever playing football and you throw 500 yards and six touchdowns, but you've never done it before, you don't even know, is that good? And Did I do it right? Holy smokes, you're fantastic. This is perfect. You're supposed, like, this business is going great. But until you have someone and others that you can work with, you don't necessarily know. And Or you could be doing the right things, but a small part of it wrong, you know? Yeah, you'll never know until you get in a group. And it's amazing when you get in a group environment, just like you mentioned about Think and Grow Rich, someone could have been there, done it, and tried a whole bunch of ways. Learn from their failures. Fail fast. Learn from those failures. That's how we really, really grow and learn. Talked about Jordan. His one of my favorite quotes of him is the reason that he's successful. He says because he took nine thousand shots, or whatever, and missed. But it's because he wasn't afraid to make the next one or a game winning shot. Hey, pass me the ball. I'm going to do it, and he's going to confidently shoot the ball, even though he's missed all those times. And you look at the best people in business; they've failed more times, whether it's they advertise it or not, they're not, you know, you don't always talk about your failures, but I know, you know, in the books I'm reading and the people I'm connecting with and everybody just says, look, I learned from that. And either you, you, you win or you learn and failure is like, okay, cool. Now it's game tape. It's stuff we can learn and grow from. And if you just sit in a, at home with a blank sheet of paper and that's your game plan because you're afraid to get started, well, then you have nothing to evaluate. And I know it's difficult. I'm not trying to be like a tough guy, like get out there, you know, and like toughen up. But at some point in time, look, nobody's going to do it for you. Right. So that young entrepreneur, they need to jump out of that helicopter. I think you have a way you kind of define that on your website. Don't you like, it's like jumping in the foggy abyss. You don't know what's down there. You just know you have to make the jump. You just hope for two things that you can find a parachute or you can find someone to help you then ride tandem. Otherwise you're going to go splat. You just don't know when. And I mean, I've been there. I could have shut everything down after my first business busted. And I'm thinking I learned more from that experience than I can ever tell anyone. It's like, but it was a failed business. Life goes on, but it's like, would I learn from it and move on? Yeah, I want to say something to add to that is it's the difference of reading something in a textbook and knowing what it means to living it and feeling what it means. And we're human beings right? We feel. We're in the moment. We experience. And I do feel like the things I've learned, good, bad, and ugly in business, are so different compared to anything I experienced in school, not even trying to shoot school down, but just saying, I forgot I forgot a, a lot about what I learned in school because it was just words on a page and things I needed to remember. But I'll tell you, I can remember every feeling I've had in business over the last four years. 
the good, the bad, the ugly, the scary. I'm feeling it just like it's crazy. It's crazy. And I know it's why I got that little streak of white hair that hides behind my headset here. Yeah. Uh, this is from kids. <laughs> That's kids, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a beautiful six-year-old daughter, so you know she definitely keeps me on my tippy toes, and, and she's uh, a sweetheart. But thankfully, I don't have too much white hair from her. At least yet, but when she's sixteen years old, yeah, that's going to be a whole different ball game. <laughs> no, I have a teenage daughter right now, dude. I'm telling you, we just wait. I don't own any firearms yet, but when she's sixteen, I probably will have a <laughs> shotgun. So, <laughs> so that's the warning to all of her "quote unquote" boyfriends. Yes. How many children do you have? Did you say three? I have a boy and a girl, and they're both teenagers. So one's about ready to go into college, and one's in high school. Yeah, the girls in high school. That's awesome. Yeah, being a parent is is just such a cool thing. It's a whole other interview we could talk about, but it's just great. It's like leading your family is different than than the business, you know, but there's a lot of common denominators and things there too. I'll say this, I, again, I, I'm talking a lot more on this interview than I usually do. I like to shut up and just listen, but the conversation hits home with me today. And we're talking about parenting for a moment. I will say the things I've learned in business I now use into my parenting with my daughter where like I correct her when she says the word, I can't, I can't do that. Or I can't do that. And I just noticed her say it and she's six years old. So I don't, I'm trying not to be too tough, but I'm working on getting it out of her vocabulary. And I don't want it to be some, like some scar that she has of like, Oh my God, my, my dad was so hard on me. He always said, you know, he forced me to say I can do stuff. I don't want her to take it where she's turned off by it. But I, she's not. She gets excited. We play with her toys, and I even have them act things out, like move this water bottle from here to here. And the one guy says, I can't. Well, because it's, it's bigger than he is. He's so small. Hey, maybe if he makes a couple phone calls to his friends and they all push it together, can they move it? Oh, yeah, they can. So she sees like, oh, when you run into a roadblock, saying I can't just ends it, where the entrepreneurial mind is like, let's figure out if we can tow this thing or figure out a solution. And I have her figuring out solutions. And it's also a confidence thing too, where she'll say, yes, I can. She had struggles going down a slide, medium to big size slides at a park. They scared her for a while. And now she goes down them. And what does she say when she's sliding down? Yes, I can. It's pretty cool. It's really, really cool. Last thing I want, I'd love to hear with your story and a couple questions left or as much time as we can sneak in together here before we got to run. I'd love to hear like who your biggest positive influence has been in your life, whether that's family, a mentor, public figure, and then we'll kind of follow it up from there. But who's someone who just, man, you just feel it when you, when you think about it, someone popped in your head right now. Yeah. I've had like two great mentors in my life. One, I was young and dumb, very young and dumb very young, early teenager. But here's someone who was in their 70s who has owned and operated multiple very successful businesses. They build it up from scratch, sell it off. That was their MO. They go, I'm not Phil Jackson who takes good and makes them better. He goes, I'm Larry Brown, takes it from nothing and creates an unbelievable team and then moves on to the next one. And I started learning a lot about business from him and his resilience And he kept saying, and I should have listened to him back then, that he kept saying, always get support, always get support. And it took me a long time to figure that one out. And then another one I had was, he always said, you always find a solution to everything. Just stop. Whatever you do, if you're frustrated, whatever it is, just stop, take a deep breath and let your mind relax for a moment. He goes, watch what'll happen. It'll pop right in. And I started doing that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my creative went off the level. It's almost like your your soul is creating it for you. The solution comes to you. It is. And, you know, the third eye, right? <laughs> Not only that, I never saw him get mad, never saw him get frustrated, never saw him get wound up. And he goes, guess what? This will pass. It'll be over with here in a few moments. It's how you're reacting to that scenario that will dictate your character too. I'll say this too. I mean, being an entrepreneur where things go awry, I've become more of the personal head coach for myself, just where I find myself a lot cooler, calmer collector. And look, being an Italian, we have this gasket that just bursts when something small goes wrong and love my dad, but he was very much like that. You know, a bill came in the mail and it was the wrong amount. 
So he's freaking out. He's throwing his hands up in the air, like, got to make the call and correct this problem. And someone's driving too slow in front of him. Oh, my God, what's this guy doing? And it's like, now I just very much put things in perspective, like, hey, it's still a great day. It's all perspective of, is this really the end of the world? This can be fixed. And we'll take care of it. I'm going to just, I'm going to find the solution. There it goes back to that. Find the solution and not get worked up because two people have the same thing happen to them. One guy gets worked up. He's heated. He's screaming. He's flipping out. He or she, they're going crazy. The same thing happened to this person. And they say, we're going to find a solution. We're going to make it happen. I got to do these next three things and it's going to better the situation. Who's got a better chance of turning it around? This guy's just heated and it's still the same problem. And this person's already thinking about fixing it in this same five minutes spent. What's the point of getting all burned out? And I know I still catch myself doing it at times, but now I go from catching myself to taking action to fix it, where in the past, it would ruin my whole day. Not only that, it's emotionally tolling and health. And people don't realize it. It's like, yeah, I used to be that guy flying off the handle. It's like, then I started like, hey, I don't feel so good. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting nowhere <laughs> by being mad right now. Getting absolutely yeah. nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I used to get burned up when I'm a Buffalo Bills fan, born and raised in Buffalo. And when they would lose when I was a kid, like teenager, I mean, I would be in my bedroom Sundays and just feel like the whole world was over. And now I still love the team as much. I'm still as crazy and I follow the team as much. But when they lose, it it stings. But then I'm like, I got a big day tomorrow for myself. And these guys, I love the team, but you know they got to focus on what they're doing tomorrow. And I have my own life to live. And so if they win or lose, it's really not dictating my happiness anymore. And I think that's where it gets a little murky for people. Is like if you're having a good or bad day because of a sports team winning you got to figure out what's going on with the rest of your day. I think that's really profound, right? Like if you're not getting any happiness today until my New York Yankees or my Buffalo Bills win, then dude, you got to start to look at the other parts of your life and it'll add to a great day. Like if I have a great day plus the Bills win, beautiful. If I have a great day and the Bills lose, hey, the Bills lost. I don't like it. I don't like the way it makes me feel, but I'm on to what I can control. That's it. And I think that's the best thing we can do. And I'm not asking people to not be have emotions. Sports are great. Some of my favorite moments with my father were watching the great Yankees teams of the 90s. We have some of the, the best bonding moments. Sports bring people together. I just interviewed a world-class athlete, rugby player, prior to interviewing you today. And we talked about how everything he's learned on the field applies to his life and business. It's a beautiful thing. Sports are great. But the problem is when people use them to dictate their happiness, that's a that's when it gets problematic, right? Oh, I agree. I want to take a quick time out. We will be back in 60 seconds with Steve. Guys, don't go anywhere. Hey, guys, it's Mike. I'd like to give a proper shout out to Navigator Bookkeeping. Look, for a long time, I ran my business without really understanding the full financial picture. I used my gut and my bank account balance to make decisions, which led to some poor choices and constant stress over my business's finances. I knew something needed to change. At the beginning of 2021, I made a decision that helped pave a more clear path for my business. I started working with Navigator Bookkeeping. Since then, my bookkeeping has been handled for me. I now understand the full financial story of my business, making important financial decisions much easier now, and it helps me plan for where my business is going. I highly recommend giving Navigator Bookkeeping an opportunity to help your business. Check them out at navigatingyourbooks.com. Again, that's navigatingyourbooks.com. It's time to know the full financial story of your business. Here's what I'd love to do, Steve. We're going to wrap up and put a bow on this episode. And so I want you to think right now, you're the author and the protagonist in your own life story, and you get to write the ending, right? And I always say, God willing, you live a long, prosperous life. You continue to thrive like you already are. You're looking back, you're reflecting on it, and you get to define your legacy. What would that be? Yeah, one of my long-term big goals, you know, obviously retired, not on a beach. I'm not a beach person, but maybe in the mountains somewhere, <laughs> being from Colorado. But 
I want to create something that, you know, obviously has residual income coming in. It has quite a few people working in it, but they're all happy, productive, and they're achieving their goals in their life because that's what I'm about too. Is like if someone, I've always had tons and tons of employees. One of my things was like, are you happy? Don't worry about the bloody business. Are you happy? And I want to create that where it's a community that we're helping other business owners of all sizes, solopreneurs all the way up to, you know, multi, multi million dollar, hundred million dollar companies. The whole point is, it's like, are we helping them achieve their business and their goals? Well, why not do that with my people as well? So I definitely want to have that community created, obviously being profitable, which it will be. And, but just to live it and start you know, I love the man. Once you get to that stage in your business, when you're managing your business, not being managed by your business, that's a beautiful place. And I love that place. And that's why I want people to be the doers and I'm the visionary. And that's a great place to be. And that's where I try to help a lot of our entrepreneurs. It's like, stop being the technician, the manager, and the entrepreneur all at the same time. You can't. Too many hats. Yeah. Think about going to a restaurant and the guy the host who greets you at the door also sits you at your table. Then they also serve you and get you your menus. They pour your drinks. They bring over your drinks. They bring over the thing of bread. Then they take your order. Then they go into the back room. They make the food. And then they come out. And then they take care of anything else that you need. Then they walk you to the front of the restaurant. And then they cash you out. Okay. That can happen. I could see somebody pulling that off. But now, how many tables does that one singular person actually help? And I'm using the restaurant example because we all can mentally walk ourselves through that story. But if that's a different business, it could be anything, a software company, how many tables can you set and walk people through? You're really limited. So until you build and operate a team and structure around it and processes around it, you're limited. And that's kind of how I felt until I, that's why I built a team now is because I was helping one client linearly at a time. And now I realized I needed to take a more of a helicopter view and make sure that the puzzle pieces are snapping into place at the right spots. And then I can go in and dive in and start to like, Hey, no, this just needs to move this way and, and click. Two things came to mind when you told me your legacy story, purpose and profits and you connect the two because you can have purpose but you could be driving your business into the ground i've been in that i've been in that seat a little bit too long with with things when they weren't working out for me in the beginning and then i i also have made a lot of money in business like prior to being an entrepreneur i was doing well in corporate but i didn't have the purpose the fulfillment so it's purpose and profits and that's what people can do when they go to your your website bizcoachsteve.com is where they can hire you. Any last words you'd like to share before you, you go off and help more businesses today? I'd say to you know all business owners, I mean, you don't have to do this by yourself. I'm proof of it. We're both proof of it. Get the help, get the support. If you're always thinking, oh, it's going to cost me an arm and leg. Actually, you know what? There are solutions out there that's not going to cost you an arm and leg, but find the right person to work with that's for you. Don't just grab the first, you know, guy who comes out of the woodwork. I've always vetted my coaches before I brought them in. I currently have two coaches. They focus on two different areas of my my life and my business. And guess what? I'm much, much better person. And my business is a much better place because of them. It's that reflection. It's, it's getting different perspectives. It's not wearing too many hats. A lot of positives. If you looked at a T-chart, positive, negative, building a team, Growing, doing masterminds, there's really no negative to it. I mean, the only thing I guess you could say is possibly the cost, but then that's not even a negative because you're saying it's a return on investment. If you're engaged and you're with around like-minded individuals, you're going to get an ROI, whether you realize it or not. And I hear a lot of the naysayers like, well, how's this going in a mastermind group going to give me an ROI? I have seen it time and time again, and I've heard that argument, and three, six months into it, that person who is the naysayer comes back and goes, okay, my business has increased 25% since I've joined this dang club. You know, okay, that's 25% more than you ever had before. Well, the scoop is, yeah, the way I look at it too is, you know, it's not money spent and then the money Mm -mm. spent fixes the problem. It's money invested to then give you access to the information that you need to take right. action on. And that's, again, that's a mentality that I didn't have before. 
you know, you we kind of live in this culture of like, there's a problem, I just want to pay to fix it. You know, the medicine, I need to fix it, the this, I need to fix it, uh, whatever. But it's more so like investing in the information that we need to take action on. And guess what? We also live in a world where there's this thing called the internet and Google, and most of the information can it be at our fingertips for free. So there's really no reason if someone's kind of comes up short on an, from an information standpoint, that's not a bottleneck. I mean, go and find it. But then the next step is, okay, now you're hiring professionals that can work with that information and help you out, which is really the when you unlock it. This was a really um, a little bit more of a workshop type interview. A lot of times it's, it's, it's longer backstory and setup. But with you, I wanted to get you on and I wanted to kind of pick your brain. So the young, and it doesn't always have to be young entrepreneurs, but people that are either where they know they are today and they, they say, this is where I am, like a growth chart. And they just put a little circle and they put today's date and they, they go, this is where I want to go. And they can listen to Steve Maybe a couple things I said make sense as well. Sometimes it happens. <laughs> and take it, and we want we want you to apply it, right? That's what we would say to our audience. Reach out to us, too. I'm always available. But can people hit you up on LinkedIn and just say, hey, man, I feel kind of stuck, and then they can schedule some time with you? Is that basically the easiest way to go about it? Yeah, I mean, I always open it up to all entrepreneurs. It's like, hey, get on a call with me for 15 minutes. It's not a sales call. I'm not trying to sell you anything. What I'm going to do is, okay, a lot of times I've had people call me up. They go, I just want to talk. And for 15 minutes. And because you have no one else to talk to. They can't talk to their spouse. They can't talk to their employees. They have no one to talk to. And just by that quick 15 minutes of someone listening and not trying to sell them crap could be their game changer. And I've had people come back at me going, you know what? You listened. You just asked simple questions and it turned, it turned everything around. I'm like, all I did was ask a couple of questions. That was the most important and best thing you could do was listen. And that's always the answer, right? I mean, the best salespeople are not speakers or talkers or presenters. They're they're listeners, understanders. Then they take that information and then they say, okay, well, now this is now that I know where you're at, this is what I feel we can do to help you. And it's a whole different thing of just like barfing the product and service at you, which too many people do. They may or may not be my client. I don't care. You know, I'm just trying to help. So get on call for 15 minutes. If I can help you, I would tough, definitely tell you. If I can point you to right direction, resources, I will do that. If you just want to talk about your business and get it off your chest, great. Yeah. I mean, we got we got Steve Feld here, and he's kicking ass in business, but he's also a black belt karate. We didn't even talk about that. Yeah. So you got so many different cool things. You're like a Swiss Army knife of knowledge and inspiration. <laughs> keep kicking ass and and doing what you're doing. And I'm honored to, you know, to kind of take you aside for an hour and pick your brain today. And I see us doing this more often. Maybe we're in a network, in a mastermind group together at some point, but this is awesome. Keep going. I know you're in a process of a new move, which takes some time to get those boxes and all that. But what I want you to do is think about how it represents growth and new opportunities. Oh, absolutely. This is awesome. Thank you so much, Steve. Appreciate your time today. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. I'd like to give a huge shout out to everyone for tuning in, especially those who listen all the way to the end to hear this message. Seriously, I appreciate you and my guests do as well. Giving a quick reminder to subscribe to this show. It's completely free and will allow you to receive notifications when new episodes are released. If you'd like to provide a tip as a gift, you can do so via patreon.com backslash miked up. It's spelled M-I-K-E-D up. Patreon.com backslash miked up. You can give as little as $1 per month or as much as you'd like. Every dollar is greatly appreciated and completely unexpected. Appreciate your reviews and your messages coming in on social as well. Keep them coming. Your feedback is valuable and absolutely means the world to me. You can check out more episodes and content at mikeduppodcast.com. We're powered by Social Chameleon. You can also follow me on Instagram. That's where I'm the most active, and it's at Mike DiCiocco, M-I-K-E-D-I-C-I-O-C-C-I-O. Thank you so much for your continued support. You guys know what to do. Be great and be grateful.